This video is a continuation of chapter 18, and I'll cover specifically bond price volatility and duration, two very, very important concepts in the world of bonds. And so bond price volatility means how much does the price wiggle, and what's causing those wiggles in price? Changes in interest rates. And so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to list some of the characteristics of bond price volatility, and then move into based on these, these characteristics, move into the concept of duration analysis, which is um, very closely, at least in my mind, connected to, to beta. Beta measures uh, how a stock co-varies relative to the market. This duration analysis, basically, in a duration statistic, will tell you how does, um, how, how does a bond price change with respect to a change in market interest rates. So the first characteristic of bond price volatility is that interest rates and bond prices move inversely relative to each other. You've heard this story before, the way the graph it is. This is the typical graph you'll see for bond prices. You'll see that when interest rates go up, bond prices will fall, or when rates go down, bond prices will go up. So here we sit in today's world, interest rates are quite low, so we're here basically. What it means is you're going to see when interest rates finally go up, bond prices will come down in the future. And that's what the bond market is worried about at, at this point in time. So you got that inverse relationship. Now, the second characteristic of bond price volatility is that coupon bond price volatility, uh, or I'm sorry, for a Back up. For a given change in yield, price changes are larger for longer term bonds. I'll say it again. For a given yield change, so for a given change in interest rates, price changes are larger for longer term bonds, longer maturity bonds. Basically, in English, this simply says long term bonds are riskier than short term bonds. And you kind of already know that. But let me show you how to, how to um, prove it to you. Let me prove it to you, um, and it'll give you some insight. And I'm going to use zeros to do it, um, which is one reason why I introduced zeros back earlier in the chapter, is because they are, like I said back then, they are quite handy in doing some quick analysis. So when you value a bond, you don't have to go through and value each and every coupon. With a zero, you only have to value and, and, and discount one cash flow, and that's the maturity value. So let's say we have... Um, Let's say we have a 10-year bond, 10-year bond, and it's a zero coupon bond. It'll mature for $1,000, and interest rates are 7%. The yield to maturity on that bond is um, 7%, and it's 10 years. And so the price of that bond will be 508.35. Okay? Now, if we had a um, drop in interest rates, so let's say interest rates drop, so we go in this direction on the graph, so we get a 10-year, uh, let's say it drops to 6%, so we get a 100 basis point drop in interest rates, this bond price will be 558.39, which is a difference in dollars of $50.04, so there you see the interest rates come down, bond prices go up. So it's $50 capital gain, basically, or 9.84%. Okay. Now, that's just part of the analysis. So let's do um, a one-year bond doing the same type of analysis, a so one-year zero. So a one-year zero at 7%. Is worth uh, 934.58, and a one-year zero with six percent interest rates. So interest rates again drop by 100 basis points to six percent. The bond price is 943.40, and so that it represents an eight dollar and eight two eight dollars and eighty two cent capital gain, um, or um, approximately. Um, let's see, 8.8, 8.82 divided 
divided by 934.58. And it's about um, just under 1% capital gain. Okay. So now what you see here is exactly what I said. Longer term bonds are riskier than short term bonds. Because here you have the long term bond. Look, same change in interest rates from 7 to 6% as we did in the one year bond. 7 to 6%. And here we had a 10% capital gain. Here we had a 1% capital gain. And if interest rates would have went from 6 to 7 and 6 to 7 here, you'd have roughly the same changes. So what you see is you see that here's the volatility. The volatility is much greater for a 10-year bond than it is a one-year bond. The third characteristic of bonds is that coupon bond price volatility in percent increases as maturity increases, but at a declining rate. Okay, so here we're dealing with coupon bonds. And so anything that increases at a declining rate is doing this. This is item three basically increasing at a declining rate. And here we have maturity, because that's what I just said. Uh, oh, and, and price volatility. Price volatility in percent on this axis and maturity. And so I said coupon bond price volatility in percent increases as maturity increases. So maturity increases, bond price volatility goes up, but it declines. It's steep here and flattens out as you go through time here. And so we can look at that carefully with an example. And here you have to use an example of a coupon, obviously, for this to work. And so if we had a two-year bond with a 5% coupon, an annual coupon now, and a 5% yield to maturity, right? we would have a price, you don't even have to do any calculations because the coupon and the yield of maturity is the same, so the price of the bond is $1,000. Okay. Um, what happens if the, if the yield to maturity goes up to 6%? When you do that calculation, the bond price goes to 981.67, which is a 1.8% a increase, 1.8% percent increase not too much now if we have a 25 year so I'm going up 12 and a half times right in terms of maturity and I have a 5% coupon and I have a 5% yield to maturity that again implies a price of a thousand dollars but if interest rates go up 100 basis points to 6% yield to maturity, the price of that bond will be 872.21. And so that is a 12.8% decline. Okay, no, this, and I should be careful here. This was a decline here. That's a decline. This is a decline when interest rates go up. But notice what happens. The maturity went up from two years, so the price volatility was, um, let's get the absolute value of it, was 1.8. And then at, at 25 years, come up over the absolute value, this is 12.8. So you see that this increased 12 and a half times, but um, from 1.8 to 12.8 certainly was not a, a 12 and a half time increase. It's only a it's only a sevenfold increase, and this is a sevenfold increase in the percent volatility, and so it increases. This increased twelve time, twelve and a half times, but this only went up seven times. And so there you see the flattening out of the curve. Okay, um, item number four is pretty simple. Item number four is that price changes are not symmetrical. And so let me exaggerate it here. Here we have yield to maturity. Here we have bond price. And what you see here is when interest rates are low, like they are in today's world, it only takes a little change in interest rates to have a big drop or change in prices because this slope is very, very steep right here. 
if interest rates were very high and you had a change in interest rates, you'd have almost no change in bond price because that slope is very, very flat. So the point is, price changes are not symmetrical. They're on the downside. In other words, on the, on the short end or at, at the um, low yields to maturity, prices are more sensitive. So maybe that explains why in part when uh, recently when people, uh, when the Fed has been making announcements throughout the semester that it might increase interest rates, you see the bond market and even the stock market going a little crazy. And so you could justify some of that price volatility as being, look, we're really on the steep part of this curve. Okay, the fifth characteristic is that high coupon bond, uh, high coupon bonds show smaller percentage changes than low coupon bonds. Okay, high coupon bonds show smaller percent changes than low coupon bonds for a given change in interest rates. And um, the reason for that is uh, it has to do with duration, and that's where, we're, where I'm, I'm heading into in the next part of the you know, page nine of my notes. Uh, you can think of, of, get a clean page here, you can think of what I'm Consent graphically, you can think of cash flows and the balancing of cash flows um, here. When when you have oh, let's watch this. When you have low coupons, so here you have period period one's coupon two three four, five, six, all the way up to maturity date. So here's the maturity of the bond. So you got all these coupons, they're all the same size, right? They're all the same $50 coupon each year. And then you get the $50 coupon, plus don't forget the big $1,000, um, the $1,000 face value that you get. So this is all the way through maturity. And you, so what happens is with high coupon bonds, the cash flows, tend to be weighted more in this direction to the left. So when you have very small coupons, most of the cash flow, so when you have small coupons, most of the cash flow is in this last payment. Okay, so if you had to balance this on a seesaw, a balance of the seesaw would look something like this at this point. And so that would basically balance these, these weights. Okay, now with a high coupon bond, the high coupon bond, the cash flows are tilted. The weight of the, the cash flows are basically off to the left overall. And so if you had to balance it, you'd put a, maybe you'd put the, um, the fulcrum to the left here with a high coupon bond. And so um, this graph will help Try, this is an, an attempt at a graphical interpretation of what duration analysis is going to help us with. Duration analysis is going to help us look at how, how the, the positioning of cash flows influence the bond sensitivity to changes in interest rates. And so you can think of duration analysis, which is where we're going in a second, is measuring that. So you can think of duration analysis as basically being the fulcrum. And so when you have a low coupon bond, like, like we had in black here, this fulcrum is going to be out to the right, meaning that it's a quite volatile bond because almost all the cash flow is very far out here. It's a long-term bond for the most part. If you weight all these cash flows, it's a very long-term bond. If you have a high coupon bond, most of the, the cash flows tend to be tilted to the left here, which means it tends to be a weighted average of, of bond cash flow that's closer to us in time. It tends to be a weighted average of a bunch of zeros, in a sense, that have weights down towards um, to the left. And so you remember I told you, you can think of a coupon bond as being a package of zeros. So you can think of each one of these as being a zero and having its own uh, sensitivity to changes in interest rates if the cash flows are tilted in this direction higher here then you're going to have um, a, a bond that's less sensitive to changes in interest rates now that 
um, may or may not make sense to you at, the, at, at this point in time because it's just a graphical analysis. But give me a few minutes to unpack duration analysis. And you'll see. Now, before we actually get into duration analysis, let's um, do some preliminary work. And the preliminary work has to do with um, changes in interest rates and how it impacts bond prices. We have seen two things so far, um, not just in this, in this video, but in the previous video you know, on Chapter 18, is that when interest rates change, there's two effects that happen to a bond. You have a price effect. Okay, so when interest rates go up, bond prices go down. But there's also a reinvestment effect. Now remember the reinvestment effect. We covered that when we covered realized yield. Remember I showed you when you had a bond, let's say it was a three-year a three -year bond, and you had $100, $100, and then it matured at $1,100, right? Including the last coupon. That in order for you to earn the yield to maturity in this bond, you had to reinvest these cash flows at the yield to maturity. So remember we grew this, we grew and compounded this cash flow out, calculated a future value, as we took the future value divided by the present value, that's not face value, future value divided by the present value, took it over to, all over to the 1 over n minus 1, uh, to, uh, to the power of 1 over n minus 1, and we came up with, um, what was it, i? Basically the, the yield to maturity. So I'll, I'll put it there. So basically what I said was, look, your ability to earn this yield to maturity depended on your ability to reinvest the cash flows at the yield to maturity. And if you reinvested the cash flows at something less than the yield to maturity, your, your realized yield would be less than the yield to maturity and vice versa. If interest rates rose immediately after buying the bond, so, so if interest rates rise immediately after buying the bond, then your reinvestment effects will go up Right? And you're re because you'll be reinvesting these cash flows at higher rates, you realize yield will go up. Okay? But you got the problem of, what the problem you have is, if interest rates go up and you want to sell the bond early, you're going to have a negative price effect. And that's what I'm going to get at in the next page here. What I want to do is look at the effects of a rise in interest rates that happen immediately after you purchase a bond. And then leave those interest rates remain unchanged until maturity. So we're going to assume a change, an increase in interest rates immediately. And we're going to um, assume those rates remain unchanged. And what we're going to see is that the price effect and the reinvestment effect, right, um, will depend, that the size of those effects will depend on the holding period in which you're investing in that bond. Let me see, let me show you. I can interpret that much better. So, let's say we have price effect here. And here we have reinvestment effect. And then we're going to have a holding period. Holding period is nothing but how long you hold the bond for. And if we have a holding period of one day, versus to maturity. So you hold a bond. Let's say you hold the bond for one day. What's going to be the price effect and the reinvestment effect? Um, and if you have a holding period where you decide to hold the bond to maturity, what will be the price effect and what will be the reinvestment effect? And here we're looking at a rise or an increase in interest rates. Okay. So let's go through it. Let's walk through it. Now, if you buy a bond and interest rates rise and you hold the bond for one day, you're going to get a negative price effect. So that's a negative sign there. You're going to get a negative price effect. Okay. But um, will you have any reinvestment effect? And the answer is no, because in the short period you hold the bond, you're not going to get any coupons for the bond. So you have no reinvestment effect. So there is no reinvestment effect by holding the bond for one period. But you will get a capital gain or a loss. You know, in this case, it'll be a capital loss. That's the negative sign here. 
Now let's say instead of holding the bond for a day, you decide instead to hold the bond to maturity. Well, if you hold the bond to maturity, you're not going to have any price effect because you're going to buy the bond, you're going to hold to maturity, you're going to get $1,000 and you know exactly what you're going to get. So you have none. You have no price effect when you hold a bond to maturity. It doesn't matter where the price goes between now and maturity, it'll eventually creep back down to $1,000 where it matures. But your reinvestment effect now, your reinvestment effect will be positive because if interest rates go up, you're going to reinvest all of the coupons that you get between now and maturity Reinvest that at higher interest rates, which means your yield and maturity is going to go up. So you're going to have a positive reinvestment effect there. Okay? Now, if interest rates fall, on the other hand, let's look at it from, from this angle now. So we've got holding period of one day to maturity. Okay? Now, if interest rates fall, you hold the bond for one day, you're going to get a capital gain because the price is going to go up. So it's going to be positive. The effect price will be positive. But if you hold a bond again for one day, you're going to have no reinvestment effect. None. You never, there's no cash flow to reinvest for one day, so you won't have any implications there. Now, if you hold a bond to maturity, even if rates fall, there's not going to be any, any price effect. Because no matter what happens, you're going to get with your $1,000. You're not selling the bond. It's just going to mature to 1000 Now, the reinvestment effect will be, uh, could be significant because you're going to be, all those coupons between now and maturity will be reinvested at a lower interest rate. So you're going to have a negative impact uh, from, from a fall in interest rates for reinvestment. Now, notice what happens. It doesn't matter if rates rise or fall, there's a positive and negative effect going on. So if rates rise, there's going to be a negative effect with price, and there's going to be a positive effect with reinvestment, and vice versa if rates fall. So what, what this is suggesting to you and to me is that when interest rates change, there are two opposing effects here. I guess we call them wealth effects, one in terms of price and one in terms of reinvestment income. They offset each other. They're moving in opposite directions. What duration analysis, what's so interesting about duration analysis is, duration analysis is going to try to pinpoint the place in which you can, this effect and this effect offset each other perfectly so you have no effect. In, in other words, Duration analysis, what's cool about duration analysis is that it's going to give you a statistic, a number, that will basically, if you manage your bonds properly, it'll, it'll allow you to have a bond or a bond portfolio that's immune to interest rate changes. Because it doesn't matter whether interest rates go up or down, you're going to balance this price effect and reinvestment effect so that the two offset, and when the two offset, you have no interest rate effects. So this wealth effects here that I'm talking about in terms of price and reinvestment, you can think of that as, you know, you can think of these things as interest rate risk. This is interest rate risk. And so what we're going to do is if we, if we structure our portfolios right, we know how to analyze our portfolios, our bond portfolios, we can develop a bond portfolio that's immunized. In other words, that's insensitive to changes in interest rates. So you don't have interest rate risk. So let's actually get into the calculation of duration and see how it works. So the duration equation is this. It looks a little ugly, but it's not too bad. Notice what I'm doing here. Look at this. Oop, I forgot a little part of the equation here. Here we go. 
Now, notice what this is. The top part, notice I'm weighting the cash flows by time. Just like I told you a minute, a few minutes ago, that I was going to take these cash flows, and this is graphically what I was doing, weighting it by time. T equals one, T equals two, T equals three. Okay, that's what I'm doing right here, but I'm discounting it. So I'm taking time-weighted cash flows and I'm discounting them back. Okay, the bottom part here, this should look very familiar to you. Okay. What this is telling you is right here, this is basically the price of the bond. The price is nothing but the present value of its future cash flows. And so here you got the cash flow, each cash flow from time e t equals one to n, n is the maturity date, and you discount each cash flow, that's the price of the bond. And so you can think of this, um, this formula as being, look, we're taking the present value of cash flows times t, and right here is the present value of cash flows, well, with the summation around it, it's the, that's the present value of cash flows, times t, there's the t, divided by price. So that's just another way to think about what we're doing here. And there's a summation sign here that we're summing over. Okay. Actually, I don't need that summation sign. That's a little redundant because I'm, that's a little redundant. So just leave it at that. Present value of cash flows times t over p. Okay. So that's the duration equation. Now this equation looks like looks like a nightmare, but it's really not. I can operationalize this equation quite easily so that you can see what this math is doing in a table. Let me show you. And I'll show you with an example. Let's assume we have a um, three-year 5% coupon, and it'll be an annual bond. Let's not go crazy with semi-annual bonds. Um, we'll be here all day. Uh, so it's a three-year 5% coupon bond with a yield to maturity of 2%. So right away you know this bond is selling at a premium. The market wants 2%. The thing is generating 5% coupon. This is an attractive bond, but you know, it's only a three-year bond, so you know, it's attractive, it's selling at a premium, but there's a limit to how much the premium is going to be because it's only a three-year bond. So now what I want to do is I want to operationalize this equation that I just showed, the big duration equation. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to draw a table. And so, um, Trying to make sure I got things neat here. So here will be year. Here will be cash flow. Here will be present value factor at 2%. Okay, so it's a, this will be discount factor at 2%. This will be the present value of the cash flow of each cash flow time t. This will be the present value of the cash flow divided by price. And this last bot right here will be the present value of cash flow divided by price times T. Ooh, that looks familiar. We just, I just showed you that part right here. Okay. There it is. So let me show you. It's a three-year bond. We don't want to go too long because it will take us too long to, to calculate everything. So let's lay out the cash flows. Without doing any calculations, you know right off the bat, this is 50, this is 50, and this is 1,050. There's the cash flows. <clears throat> now, the next thing you need to do is you need to calculate the discount factor. Well, the discount factor is simply 1 over 1 plus the yield to maturity. Discounted one period. And so we're saying, look, if you take a dollar and discount it back at 2% for one period, it's worth about 98 cents. And if you take a dollar and discount it 2% for two periods, it's worth about 96 cents and so on. 94. These are, these are our present value discount factors at 2%. Now, the present value of this cash flow. So you get this cash flow one year from now. What's it worth? 
well, it's worth 98% of that. It's worth $49.02. So the present value of $50 discounted at 2% for one year is $49. That's how you interpret that. And so this last cash row, this is the big cash row right here, that's worth $989.42. Now, if you add these guys up, you're going to get 1086.50. You look at that. Like, oh, I wonder what that number is. Hmm. One thousand eighty-six fifty. Well, hmm. I just counted, calculated the, the sum of the present value of the cash flows. Oh, that's the price of the bond. Yeah. Okay. Let's go on. Now, let's take the present value of the cash flows and divide it by this price right here. So 49 divided by 1086 is 0 0.0451. Take the 48 divided by 1086, this is 0 0.0442. Take the 989 divided by the 1086 and you get 0 0.9106. Add this up. Ooh, look at that. It comes out to be a nice round one. It better come out than one and you get a problem. Basically what we did here was we said, look, in terms of present value, the first cash flow is worth about 4.5% of the whole value of the bond. The second cash flow is worth a little less than 4.5% of the whole value of the whole bond. And it's that last cash flow, the last coupon plus the face, is worth 91% of the bond. So, the, so all I'm doing is breaking up the bond value in, into percent, and it better add up to 100% or 1. Okay, we got that down. So now, let's take this number and multiply it by t. So you can think of years t if you want. So you can put a t up here if you want. So this will be 0 0.0451. Multiply this by 2. And this will be 0 0.0884. Multiply this number by 3. And this will be 2.732. Add it up. And you get 2.8653. Okay. That is in years. Okay. So we took these this present value, these cash flows, weighted it by T, and we got it in years. So we got time in there, so time is in years. Notice what I did. I just operationalized. And by the way, that's duration. That's the duration that we want. D. Look, I took the present value of those cash flows, add them all up. And so I basically operationalized this formula. See the sums? I did all the sums. And, and going down, down in the columns. Okay, so there we have it. So how would you interpret this? Now, here's where the value of duration comes, comes into play. So here, I'll interpret this carefully. I'll say, if we hold this bond, 2.8653 years. We hold this bond almost three years. The price effect will exactly offset the reinvestment effect. Okay. So if we hold this bond for this many years, the price effect will, re will offset the reinvestment effect. Another way to state it is, if I hold this bond for less than 2.86 years, Either the price effect or the reinvestment effect will outweigh, one of, one of them will weigh, outweigh each other and will have interest rate risk. If we hold the bond past 2.86 years, let's say we hold the bond to maturity, then we're going to have interest rate risk because either the reinvestment effect or the price effect will offset it, will, will outweigh what's going on. Okay? If you hold the bond to maturity, you know, actually, you know, to, to back that up for a second, if you hold the bond to maturity, you know there will be no price effect um, because it will mature to $1,000. You'll have reinvestment effect risk that you have to deal with. And so you'll, have a, um, and a, you'll still have interest rate risk. Because so the point is you get rid of interest rate risk and you immunize your bond, the bond portfolio, if you set your holding period, the period at which you hold the bond, equal to the duration that I just calculated for this bond. And you can verify that um, 
you can verify that fairly easily. Okay? So, here's how you do it. Walk you through it. Let's assume, give me an example how to verify that. I'm saying if you hold the bond to this point, 2.86 years, 5.3 years if you want to be exact, at that point, your reinvestment effect will be offset by your price effect and you will have no interest rate risk. If you hold it for a period shorter than that, you'll have interest rate risk. If you hold it for a period longer, you'll have interest rate risk. So let me show you what happens here. Let's take, um, Interest rates are 2% at the moment. So if we compound things forward, 50 times 1.02 to the 1.8653 years, we get a cash flow worth 51.88. So I'm going to reinvest this cash flow all the way up to this point. Then I'm going to reinvest the next cash flow, this 50, for so it's 50 times 1.02. Good one, I'll write it there to the 0.8653 power, that will equal $50.86, right? Plus now you gotta remember, we gotta back up and compute the present value of this last cash flow. We have to compute the present value. Here we have computed future value. We need to go back a little bit to figure out all the cash flow at this point in time. So that 1,050 divided by 1.02 1 to the 0.1347 power. That's 1 minus 0.8653 equals 0.1347. That is worth uh, 1,047.20. And so when you add 5188, the 5086 and the 1047 20, that sum equals 1149.94. Okay? Now, let's see what happens. So that's a future value amount. Let's see what happens if I increase interest rates by this crazy amount. I'm going to increase interest rates from 2% to 12%. You know, it's kind of like you know, maybe uh, Spain or Greece or, you know, some South American country where the, the interest rates change like crazy overnight. What I'm going to say here is that when interest rates go up to 12% from 2%, you should see a dramatic, uh, you're going to have a dramatic effect on your bond, on, on bond prices when interest rates go up, but you're going to have a much better reinvestment effect. And so what you're going to see is the two are going to offset each other. So when I'm all said and done, I'm going to have a future value at this point in time that's pretty darn close to 1,000 to 1149. It won't be exact. Duration analysis is not exact. It's a very good approximation for the most part. Now I'll get into why it, you know why there's slight differences and and errors in a few seconds, but. Um, Let's actually compute the value of this cash flow right here, assuming we reinvest at 12%, 12%, and 12%. Okay. When we do that, we're going to take the first cash flow, reinvest it for the 1.8653 years, and we get 61.77. $50 times 1.12 to the 0.8653 gives me 55.15. And then the last cash flow, 1,050. And I'm going to take the present value of that for 0.1347 years. And I get 1,034.09. Add this up. And look, I've come pretty darn close to the 1149.94. And so for the most part, I'm fairly well immunized, but not perfectly, to a, a, a mega change in interest rates. So if I hold this bond 
just under three years, I'm assured of getting about 1150 let's call it $1,150, in cumulative cash flow, future of cash flow, 2.86 years from now. So if I hold the bond that long, this is how much money I'm going to have. I'm pretty darn sure I'm going to have about that much within a couple dollars of it. So you can see the value of duration analysis. Now, let's look at selected characteristics of duration. A selected char character characteristics of duration. First characteristic is, and this is really cool, this is the duration of a zero is equal to its maturity. I'll say it again, the duration of a zero coupon bond is equal to its maturity. So if you have a 10 year zero, the duration is 10 years, it's 10. If you have a 12 year bond, zero, the duration is 12. And it's quite easy to show that. I'm gonna give you an ex show you quickly with the table. So here's the year, T, one, two, blah, 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 blah. Um, let's say it's 20 years. And we have the cash flow each year. There is none. It's all zero until you get to the last one. And the last cash flow is $1,000 for zero. The present value cash flows, let's say it's 4%. They don't matter. All the way here don't matter. The last one matters. And that's 1 over 1.04 to the 20th power for an annual bond. And that's 0.4. Five, six, three, eight. Okay, so the present value of the cash flows doesn't matter. Um, present value of the last cash flow is four hundred fifty-six dollars and thirty-eight cents. So in other words, the present value, the, the the price of a zero coupon bond that's twenty years, um, that has twenty years to maturity at a four percent interest rate is worth four hundred fifty-six dollars today. So you take the present value of that cash flow and divide it by price. Well, that's 456.38 because there's no other cash flows here. For the last cash flow, 456 divided by 456, that equals 1. Okay, remember I told you it's going to have to add up to 1, so I just accounted for all the cash flows. 100% of the cash flows are where? The last cash flow. Then, the last column, make sure I can fit it in the video here, the last column is present value of the cash flow divided by price times T. Well, this is all zero, it doesn't matter. When you get to the very last cash flow, it's one times 20, and this is 20. That equals 20. So therefore, this is the duration. The duration of a zero is equal to its maturity. So it doesn't have to be 20, it could be a five year, whatever you want here. The analysis is always the same, basically. The analysis all boils down to this last row. And the duration will always be equal to this number right here, the bonds maturity. So, you see why zeros are nice and convenient? They are. Now, the next characteristic of duration is the holding holding time to maturity and yield to maturity constant. So holding fixed the time to maturity and the yield to maturity. A bond's duration and interest rate sensitivity are higher when coupon rate is lower. Oh, that sounds like a nightmare. Let's figure it, let's look at it, do some quick numbers, quick example here. So here we got years to maturity. And here we have yield to maturity. Here we have coupon rate. And here we have the duration. Okay. In years, duration in years. And so let's have a 10 year, 10 year bonds. We're going to look at 8%, 8%. And then we're going to have a six year to 12 year coupon rate. And if you did the calculation at home, you could confirm this that if you had a 10 year bond with an 8% yield to maturity with a 6% coupon, the duration would be 7.6 years. You had a 10, 10 year coupon, 10 year maturity bond, 
yield to maturity is eight percent. Coupon rates double, right? Twelve percent coupon. The duration is going to be six point seven years. And so holding these constant, because I didn't change them from one bond to the next, holding the years to maturity constant, uh, yield to maturity constant, all I varied was the coupon rate. When the cash flows are closer in time to us now, to the present, the duration drops. And so that is exactly what I was trying to tell you with this graph, which at that point in time may not have made much sense, but when the, cap, when the coupons are higher, like at the 12%, that means this, these weights are higher. The fulcrum goes to the left, which means duration. So you can think of this as 6.7 years versus 7.6 years in this example for the duration in this fulcrum balancing those cash flows. Okay, that wasn't too bad. Now, number three, characteristic of duration, says holding the coupon rate and yield to maturity constant. Duration increases with time to maturity, but at a decreasing rate. Okay, years to maturity. And we're going to have um, yield to maturity. And we're going to have a coupon rate. And we're going to have duration in this one. And so let's say 5 and 10, 8, 8, 10%, 10%. Look what happens. Here you have um, holding the yield to maturity constant, holding the coupon rate constant. I'm varying, in fact, I'm doubling the maturity. Notice when I double the maturity, which is measured in years, I did not double the duration. The duration did not double. So as you increase the maturity, the duration increases, but at a declining rate. Okay, the fourth characteristic of duration is holding maturity in the coupon rate constant. The duration of a coupon bond or higher when the yield to maturity, the bond's yield to maturity is lower. The duration of a coupon bond or higher when interest rates are lower. I think you could best see this quickly. Um, if, you were about, if you were to look at the different the price and yield to maturity of a coupon bond. What it's saying is, when interest rates are low, bond prices are more sensitive, and so your duration is going to be higher when interest rates are low than when interest rates are high. Because your bond price, you can change interest rates a whole lot. Bond prices are barely going to change on this axis, so that's not too hard to see. Now the next, the fifth one, the fixed fifth characteristic is that the duration of a perpetuity is equal to 1 plus the yield to maturity divided by yield, oops, yield to maturity. Now, at first blush, um, you know, think about it. You have a, you have a perpetuity, and that's a, a cash flow that lasts forever, and you're calculating duration in years. And so you would think that, wow, if you have a perpetuity, it goes on to infinity, then your duration is probably infinity. You would think that, but that's not the case. It turns out the duration of a perpetuity is simply this formula. So if you assume um, the yield to maturity is 7%, then for a perpetuity, the duration is going to be only 15.29 years. So this is a bond that pays 7% forever in terms of a coupon, never matures, its duration is 15.09 or 15.29. And if you had 3% yield to maturity, the duration would be 34.33. The only way you would have an infinite maturity, uh, infinite duration, 
is basically as as interest rates go to close to zero. So as interest rates go to zero, as bottom goes up, then your, your duration would go up to infinity. Uh, but for normal interest rates, normal level of interest rates, duration is, is a fairly tame number. You know, think about what would happen now. Um, if, if interest rates were really close to zero, your duration would be infinite. Your duration would be infinite as interest rates drop to zero. This would skyrocket. You'd basically be on this graph at a point where you almost have an infinite slope. And you know, by intuition, it says, look, when interest rates change, right, um, even if they're really close to zero and interest rates change, you don't have infinite changes in bond prices. Uh, you may have big changes in bond prices, but not infinite price changes. So um, that helps set a little, set a little bit of intuition for you. Helps you with intuition. The next item, next characteristic is that the duration of a portfolio is simply a weighted average of the bonds in the portfolio, the duration of the bonds in the portfolio. So what that says is this is a weighted average of the durations of the bond in the portfolio. So here we have duration of bond I and it has the weight I and these weights are the market values. So the weights are the market value of each bond relative to the market value of the entire portfolio. And that is their duration of the bond, uh, how to compute it, the duration of the portfolio. So when you look at Vanguard's portfolios, and Vanguard shows you on their website that this bond, this bond portfolio has a duration of five years, it's a weighted average of the 1,000 or so bonds that they have in their portfolio where the weights are the market value of bond I divided by the market value of the entire portfolio, P. This, by the way, should look very, very familiar because we basically had the same concept when we did the, um, the beta of a portfolio. The beta of a portfolio is the sum of the weights of each stock times the beta of each stock. It's basically the same concept, a simple weighted average. For the betas, a simple weighted average for the durations. And so, I'll give you a quick example. Let's say we have uh, bond A, bond B, we have market value, and we have the duration. Just making numbers up here. So if we have bond A is worth 1100, duration of five, bond B, market value of 900, duration of seven, the portfolio of, the, of these bonds uh, will have a, let's see, 11 to 20, 11 to 20 times five plus nine to 20 times seven. We will have a duration of 5.9 years for this bond portfolio. You know it had to be somewhere in the middle of these two. It's a weighted average. But the weight tended to be a little bit more toward bond B, and so it's not quite six. It's a little bit below. Okay. Now, the last characteristic is by far the most important characteristic of duration. So duration is quite a, sometimes called a very rich, quite rich statistic in, in the world of bonds. And so duration... Um, and a slightly modified version of duration helps to measure the price sensitivity of bonds or bond portfolios to small changes in interest rates, small changes. So when I say small changes, it's not like I showed you a few minutes ago where I went from 2% to 12%. That's, um, what, 1,200 basis point, no, 1,000 basis point change. I'm talking small changes. Is a, uh, is a couple basis point change. Duration is a very good approximation for that. Duration, uh, and why it's approximation is duration assumes a linear relationship between bond prices and yield to maturity. It's not a linear relationship. It's a curved relationship. And so duration, it basically assumes a straight line here when the actual changes in the bond price follow this convex curve. 
And so duration is an approximation. The further, so you start here at a certain price, P subscript zero, yield to maturity zero. And if you change the yield to maturity, you change the price. So if you increase yield to maturity, bond prices will fall. The actual fall will be here. So if yield goes to here, but your duration estimates will, will figure a price that's a little less. Okay? This difference here is due to convexity, meaning curvature. The calculation for convexity is a nightmare because whenever you get to curve stuff, things that are curves and not straight lines, you start getting these squared terms and cube terms and quad and things at a fourth power. It's a headache. We can trudge through it. We can slam through it. Um, but probably not in this class. I won't get to it. Um, it's usually reserved. I, I do the calculations um, in an advanced investments class. Yeah. So what I'm saying is small changes in interest rates. Going back and forth just a little bit has, see, these lines are almost touching. There's no difference between the duration estimate and the actual change in the, in the, in the actual price. Okay. So here's the key, key formula. The percentage change in bond price equals minus D mod times delta BPT divided by 100, where D mod equals D, the duration we've just been calculating, divided by 1 plus the yield to maturity. So what this says in English is your percentage change in your bond price due to a change in interest rates. Here's the change in interest rates. This is the number of basis points it changes by as a relative to a 100 basis point change. Okay? It's this times your modified duration, which is the duration we've been calculating, divided by 1 plus the yield to maturity. You need to put the negative sign in there because when interest rates go up, bond prices go down and vice versa. So you got to have that inverse relationship. See the downward sloping? That's an inverse relationship. So this is the key. This is why duration shows up in Vanguard's bond mutual fund uh, prospectuses, annual reports, and it shows up right up front to tell investors this is your measure of risk. The higher the duration, the higher the percentage change in the bond price. In other words, that's bond price volatility right there due to changes in interest rates here. So that's what very important. So let's actually do a calculation to hit this home. coupon, yield to maturity, 3%, so therefore you know P equals 1,000, no calculations, that's easy. Turns out that the duration, you can try this at home, the duration equals 12 years. And um, you, can, you can verify that at home, that's the calculation. And so now, um, Let's say that the yield to maturity goes to 3.5%. So it goes up 50 basis points, 50, right? What will be the new price? In other words, what, and from that new price, we can calculate the change or the difference in the percent change. So um, let's use duration to do that calculation. 12 divided by 1, oh, 0.03, the, the first yield to maturity, don't use the second one, use the yield to maturity that you're starting at. Okay. And so we can see when yield to maturity goes up, your duration will go down, right? And that's consistent with the downward sloping graph. Let's see if I can fit it on here. See, the downward sloping graph, the slope gets flatter down here when yield to maturity is high. So when this bottom gets high, this whole thing drops meaning it's, it's adjusting for this curvature here, times the change in basis points, which are 50. 
and it's positive, divide it by 100. So this is one half. And so the whole thing comes out to be minus 6.18%. So therefore, if you have a 15-year bond, 3% coupon, and rates go from 3% to 3.5%, this bond will drop 6.5%. In other words, you'll have a capital loss of 6.818%. And you can verify that. I wonder how you can verify that. Well, you recalculate the bond with a 3.5% um, price. At 3.5% yield to maturity. The price, when you plug that into your calculator, the price will be 942.04. And what you end up with is um, the actual, actual bond price will be 934. Well, it went from 1,000 to 942. The duration estimate will say it drops 6%. So that means it's going to be 1,001 minus 0 0.0618. That's 938.20. And that's pretty close. That's not far. That's uh, $3.80 off or 0.38%. Which is not bad because look, we went, we dropped from a thousand down to nine forty-two. We just dropped fifty-seven dollars, and we came within three three dollars and eighty cents of the actual change in price. Mm -hmm. So that's not too bad. So now some caveats with respect to duration. Duration assumes that the yield curve is flat. Yeah, I don't need that. Well, let's see if I can find it. Yeah, go well, way back to when I calculated duration in the table. I, just, I assumed when I did this calculation, the yield curve was flat because I discounted each and every cash flow at 2%. So it was basically, as I look, the yield curve is flat at 2% because here's maturity, here's the yield in percent, 2% for each and every cash flow for one year, two year, and three year. So beware of that. It's technically not the right thing to do, but that's the, the assumption that duration uses. Remember, we went through the whole bootstrapping example to show you that that's not the way to do things technically, but it's a good approximation. Then the other thing is duration is, is, is good for a small change in interest rates. And that when you have a large change in interest rates, you need to take into consideration the curvature, this part. And that curvature is called convexity. This is called convexity. And again, that math to calculate that little bit is a lot of work. And it looks kind of ugly, so um, we just talk about it and draw pictures of it without having to get into the, the you know, grunge through. It's, it's quite a few calculations. So that's it for duration.